Okay, I think we've got everyone for the moment. So, hello everyone. Um, you are all on mute. Uh, if I could just ask you to remain that way, please. If you want to turn your video on, by all means, please do. But uh, if you can, just stay on mute so we can reduce any sort of background noise uh, throughout the webinar. So, um, thank you ever so much for joining us. This is uh, webinar eight. So, for eight weeks, uh, we've been bringing you these uh, webinars focusing on our research. Um, we're really pleased that you've been joining us. For some of you, I think this is the first time that you've joined us. So just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Matt Cottleshaw. I'm the Head of Fundraising and Communications at the Bone Cancer Research Trust. And I'm joined, hopefully, at the side of me on your screen, um, by Zoe, who is our Head of Research Information and Support, and uh, Vicky, who is uh, our Research Manager. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Zoe, who is going to introduce our guest speaker this week and um, the format is I do the introductions, Zoe introduces our speaker, our speaker will take you through a presentation um, and if you have any questions throughout that presentation please do fire them over to us. What we ask you to do is to use the chat function and um, if you have the ability to have two windows open we'd suggest that you keep the chat function open throughout so if you have a question you can just jot it down and send it over to us and we do our best to make sure we answer them all um, before the end of the webinar. We've got a number of questions that were asked in advance, so thank you for those. Vicky has got those. So once our speaker is finished, Vicky will put all your questions to uh, Liz, Dr. Liz McFrandon, our speaker, and um, that will come at the end of the presentation. So uh, if there are any questions, remember there are no silly questions, just jot them down. Just one thing to note that this webinar is focused on research, it isn't about personal circumstances or personal treatments. Um, if you do have questions about that, you can contact our support and information team using support at bcrt.org.uk. Okay, so we hand over to you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, so as Matt said, welcome to our last um, webinar of the series. It's good to see you all. Um, so this week we are joined by Dr. Elizabeth Roundhill, who will talk to you a little bit about um, her project on Ewing sarcoma. Um, before she does, I just thought I'd, I'd give you a bit of history. Um, so Liz works in the lab of Professor Sue Birchall and uh, we have supported research in this laboratory for a number of years and in fact Professor Sue Birchall was one of the first recipients of a bone cancer research trust grant back in 2008 um, and since then both us at bone cancer research trust and our friends at Ewing sarcoma research trust have continued to support this program of research um, and so I'm sure you, you'll agree we're all happy and, and really excited to hear the progress that's been made um, so Liz will talk about this and then also about some future work that has now been funded by the Little Princess Trust. Um, and we're delighted that representatives from both the charities could join us on the webinar. So I'll now hand over to Liz and she'll talk you through it. Can you see that everyone? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep, okay, fab. <laughs> so afternoon everyone and, and thank you BCRT for inviting me to give this um, webinar this afternoon. Um, as Zoe said, I'm based at the University of Leeds in the Children's Cancer Research Group and, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on bone cancer stem-like cells but particularly focusing on Ewing sarcoma. Um, so I'll start the talk by giving you a brief overview of Ewing's, um, talking about our patient-derived cultures and why we're using patient-derived cells, about Ewing's sarcoma and its role as a cancer stem-like cell disease and how we might target um, Ewing's sarcoma more effectively, and also some of our future work. And as Zoe mentioned, it's been funded over a number of years by various charities. So just a background for Ewing sarcoma, I'm sure you're, you're all aware of this. Um, so Ewing's generally occurs um, in 13 to 24 year olds and tumours can form in the soft tissue or indeed bony sites. It's the second most frequent primary bone tumour and there's about 80 new cases per year in the UK. Um, on the left are some light microscopy images of some Ewing sarcoma cells in a tumour. 
and that you can see they appear as small round cells and the tumors are very very undifferent undifferentiated and the Cells in these images have been stained with hematoxin, which stains the nucleus blue. And you can see there's a very, very large nucleus to the Ewing sarcoma cell. And they're surrounded by this very thin um, cytoplasm, which is shown in pink. As many of you know, I'm sure the current treatment is a combination of surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And there are a few prognostic markers that are used in the clinic to um, predict prognosis and outcome for patients. So the presence of localized or metastatic disease, the presence of a pelvic primary, and also the tumor size. So if you may have heard, all Ewing sarcoma cells contain a fusion gene. Um, and this is reported to be the primary initiating event that really drives Ewing sarcoma. So what do we really mean by a fusion gene? Um, so on the left, you can see there's an image of Sorry. On the left, you can see there's a, um, a light microscopy image, as in the previous slide, of some Ewing sarcoma cells. And just there is a, a very large nucleus of a Ewing sarcoma cell. And DNA is located in the nucleus of cells, as we've heard over the last few weeks. And DNA is actually arranged in chromosomes inside the nucleus. And, oops, sorry. and using a technique called G-banding, we can visualise the chromosomes as a chromosome spread, as shown below. In non-cancer, so normal um, cells, the G-banding or chromosome spread appear, chromosomes appear as 22 pairs with the X and Y gender chromosomes. But in Ewing sarcoma cells, there's something happening with chromosome 11 and 22. So there's a normal appearance of these chromosomes. But interestingly, the rest of the chromosomes appear pretty much normal. And this is consistent with the fact that in Ewing's there's a very, very low mutation rate. And what we mean by that is there's very, very few mutations in the DNA. But what is this fusion gene? So you might have heard the fusion gene be referred to as EWS fly one. And this is the most common fusion gene in Ewing sarcoma. And essentially EWS R1 is located on a normal chromosome 22. And FLY1 is located, as shown here in blue, on chromosome 11. And what happens in the translocation is you actually get fusion of chromosome 22 and the EWS gene to the region containing FLY1 of chromosome 11, generating this EWS FLY1 fusion. And this gene can be used to accurately diagnose Ewing sarcoma. And in addition, it is used um, worldwide in addition to CD99. But what does it do? So it actually generates a new transcriptional activator, which essentially means this novel fusion gene not only drives expression of genes that would normally be turned on by EWS and FLY1, it actually generates ex drives expression or decreases expression of a range of other genes. And that's what really initiates the Ewing sarcoma. So as I mentioned on an earlier slide, um, Ewing sarcoma can occur in the soft tissue or in the bones, but the most common site is the pelvis um, and is also commonly observed in the long bones. Um, the five year survival for patients with metastasis is um, less than 20 to 40% compared to those with localized disease, which is around 70%. And recurrence and relapse occurs, um, the survival following recurrence or relapse is actually less than 10%. For localized patients, despite having localized disease and despite surgery and aggressive chemotherapy, 30% of these will still relapse and the survival is less than 10%. And it's currently unknown which of these localized disease, patients with localized disease at diagnosis will go on to relapse. We currently have no way of identifying them. Late relapse is also common and this can be great 10 or 20 years later after diagnosis and again the five-year survival is, is very low at less than 10 percent. So what we really need is novel biomarkers to identify which patients fall into each of these groups particularly in the localized group, disease group which of these are going to relapse and which are going to relapse in any of the groups so to allow us to have improved grouping of patients for improved treatment. So Ewing sarcoma patients actually respond very differently to treatment so, and show differential response. So as shown in green here in a, in a, in a cartoon tumour, following treatment, in some cases, you'll see a decrease in the number of tumour cells and actually 
complete destruction of the tumour, leading to complete response or cure. In some cases following treatment, although some of these green bulk tumour cells will be destroyed, some cells will survive because they have some intrinsic or inherent ability to, be, to resist the chemotherapy and survive, shown here in grey. So there's some kind of partial response to the therapy. However, these cells are also able to repopulate the tumour, generate more of themselves and the bulk tumour, potentially at localised or metastatic sites, leading to progression and relapse of the tumour. In some cases as well, the tumour shown here in purple following treatment can show no response at all. It's completely refractory and this leads to just progressive disease. I think the most common um, scenario that for most patients is this middle section where we see some inherent resistance and initial partial response to therapy, but then this progression and relapse. So we really need some new improved therapy options to move all patients into this top group where we see complete response and cure for everybody. So we really need ways of targeting this metastatic and drug resistant disease. But translational research does work. So in 1975, for example, 10% um, of young people had a five year survival in the UK. And this has increased to 80% in 2018. But clearly for bone cancer patients, there's not really been much improvement in the last 30 years. So there's still more progress to be made here in 2020. And actually next week, the BCRT are going to be releasing some new um, data that's co recently come out of the Euro 2012 um, trial. So keep your eyes out for that. So we're opting to use patient-derived cell cultures in our studies and this were, and the cultures are collected as part of um, the Gino Young study which was developed a number of years ago and it's a UK-wide biological study in which we collect Ewing sarcoma tissue from patients at surgery at diagnosis, resection and relapse. And this work has been funded by ESRT and the Bone Cancer Research Trust. So we collect the tissue from Birmingham, the ROH, Newcastle University and also Leeds and with the help of the infrastructure um, um, guys from BC, that BCRT are funding in all the other orthopaedic centres, we're hoping to extend this to, so that all centres will be collect, all orthopaedic centres will be collecting um, tissue from us at surgery. So what do we do once we have a, a Ewing sarcoma tissue? How do we generate these patient derived cell cultures that we can use in the lab to really identify these new biomarkers and new targets for therapy? Um, so they the tissues arrive in media and immediately we freeze some in a compound known as OCT. So we have a record and um, a section of the, the tissue that we can go back to, which is sort of a a sort of point of reference as what the, the state of the tumour was when it first arrived. Um, any tissue in the sample, so soft tissue in the sample, will be macerated or chopped up and will be cultured on the plastic in the lab in tissue culture. Any bone in the sample, shown here in white, will be digested using a mix of trips and EDTA to release any cells in the bone and these will also be cultured in the lab. So one of the first things we do when we've received, when we're generating our cell cultures is check that they actually are Ewing sarcoma cells. So again, we look for this classic EWS5-1 fusion gene, which should be in every Ewing sarcoma cell. And we do this using FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization using an EWS1 break apart probe. And we also look for staining of CD99 using immunocytochemistry. And this, the staining is just shown here as brown staining. Um, surrounding the Ewing sarcoma cells and you can see the nucleus of the cells in blue. So once we've confirmed that our patient derived cell cultures are Ewing cells, um, we, well, once we've confirmed that we're then able to use them in, in the lab and one of the first things I wanted to do, well, to show you really is why are we using patient derived cell cultures as opposed to established cell lines because they're widely available, we can buy them from companies, why are we not using established cells, established cell lines? So one thing that we have observed when we sequenced um, the established cell lines and our primary patient derived cell cultures, so by sequencing I mean looking at the RNA expression of all RNAs in the cells, um, 
we actually saw that the established cell lines grouped independently from the patient derived cell cultures using hierarchical clustering, showing that the established cell lines are not really very similar to the patient derived cell cultures, which have just been isolated from patient tumor. So that's why we've chosen to use these patient derived models as preclinical tools, because they more closely represent the tumor than the established cell lines. So as I mentioned, one of our aims really is to um, try and identify some new therapies um, for Ewing's patients. And new drug development sounds like a, a great idea, um, but when you look at the time and the number of patients um, that are required to, to carry out these studies, it looks sort of more challenging. So going from a phase one safety trial up to a phase three, where you're comparing the um, efficacy of a new compound with existing um, strategies, you can see the number of patients increases dramatically, the time to complete increases, only one in 5,000 compounds actually reach clinical trials and each new drug in humans has a cost of around 1.2 billion. So our strategy, um, we've had taken an, an alternative strategy and are carrying out a drug repurposing screen, which means we're determined the efficacy of some clinically approved compounds in Ewing sarcoma. So what that means is we're determining if some compounds that have that are currently or have been used to treat other cancers, other diseases, will they be able to kill Ewing sarcoma cells? And if so, because they've been used to treat other drugs and other um, diseases and have passed um, the relevant safety criteria, they may be potentially more rapidly transitioned into the clinic. So this experiment um, in the lab, what do we actually do? So the cells are seeded onto plastic um, and at one time I can screen 80 compounds within an hour. Um, the cells are seeded onto plastic, treated with the drugs for 48 hours and then cells are stained with a, nucle a nucleic stain known as DAPI. Um, we say in the cytoplasm using TOTO3. And then the plates are passed um, through a machine known as the operetta, which is essentially a giant scanner that you might have at home to scan photos or documents. And the plate enters the machine and is able to scan across the plate and using the presence of the DAPI, the nuclear marker and the cytoplasmic marker, count the number of cells that are present. And we get a merged image um, and output similar to this at the end of the the, um, on the right of the slide. So it allows us to rapidly count cells that are remaining after you've added a, a drug. And as I said, within an hour of screening, I can have, have analysis on 80 compounds. So our drug screen is, a, is um, a commercially available screen and it covers a wide range of compounds and there's over a thousand compounds in this screen. So just to give you a little bit of of an example of some of the data that we've been able to generate so far. So this is an example of a, a patient derived during sarcoma cell culture. Um, this is the vehicle control on the far left. Um, and you can see the cells are stained with DAPI in blue, staining the nucleus, and TOTO3 in red, staining the cytoplasm. And interestingly, when you stain with three chemotherapy chemotherapeutic drugs, which I'm sure um, you'll recognize as compounds used in the treatment of Ewing's, 10 micromolar of these compounds, which is way above anything that is, um, would be used in the clinic, there is still cell surviving, which really shows again how the Ewing sarcoma cells really are very resistant to um, conventional chemotherapies. And this new work is um, funded by the Little Princess Trust. So as I, I mentioned um, a few slides ago, um, one of the challenges for treating um, Ewing sarcoma patients is the fact that following conventional uh, chemotherapy, although the bulk cancer cells are destroyed, we have these gray cancer stem-like cells that are remaining that are able to repopulate the tumor and cause relapse at local and metastatic sites. So how are we gonna target these? So our hypothesis is to, if we can destroy these gray cancer stem-like cells with a cancer stem-like cell targeted therapy, and then use a conventional chemotherapy to kill the bulk cancer cells, the tumor will be destroyed and this will lead to cure. So to do this, we really need to understand the biology of these cancer stem like cells to really generate these much needed CSC targeted therapies. 
So the key characteristics of a CSC in order them to be able to cut, induce this relapse must be to be drug resistant. So by this, I mean in the bulk tumour treated with conventional chemotherapy, this cancer stem like cells will survive. And they also have to have the ability to self renew. So from a single cell to be able to repopulate the tumour. So we have chosen a functional approach to isolate these cancer stem like cells from the bulk tumour, taking into account and using the ability of the cells to be drug resistant and self renew and self renew. So to do this, initially I isolate the cells that are capable to self renew. So a single cell is seeded into each well of these 96 well plates and I actually run 10 plates at a time. So that's 960 cells per experiment. The cells are left to grow for three weeks. And then after three weeks, I analyze each of these wells to identify if that single cell has been able to self renew and produce a new population. If they have, I then go on to evaluate the multidrug resistance of the cells. So are they also resistant to therapy, the second characteristic required to, as a CSC? And what we see here in the primary ES cells, so from the bulk tumor cells, there is some um, response to doxorubicin. But in the cancer, Ewing sarcoma cancer stem like cells, there's an increase in the number of cells that are surviving. So they do have that resistant property. So the CSCs that we're isolating do have drug resistance and they can self renew. So they have those two key characteristics. So, as I said, we, what we want to do is try and define therapies or markers of these CSCs. So, to do this, we analyze the RNA expression of the primary ES cells, so the bulk. Um, patient drive cell culture and the Ewing sarcoma cancer stem like cells using RNA sequencing and our protocol is just shown here and we compared the expression so the RNA expression profile of those two groups using DC2 and what we found were 561 genes were differentially expressed so would expressed at different levels between the primary ES cells so the bulk tumor cells and the cancer stem like cells and this is just a heat map on the left, um, sort of a small version of, of the out, complete output. And on the left is the, the, the genes are listed. And on, on top of the, um, cell, the cell cultures, and in blue are the ESCSCs and the olive color are the parental bulk cells. And red is indicative of high RNA expression and blue of low expression. And you can see there's some genes here that have a very different expression profile that are CSCs compared to the bulk um, cancer patient derived cells. So to just look at this in more detail, when we plot, when we plot all 561 genes that were significantly different, you can see them on this graph shown by each of these dots or, or squares or colored dots. They're all represented in this figure. Um, and on the left um, of this dotted line, you can see these are all the genes that were decreased in the Ewing sarcoma cancer stem like cells. But because we want to try and find a target that we can hit with an inhibitor, we want to know which genes are increased in the ESCSCs. So we're interested in all these that fall to the right of this dotted line. And based on the um, significance using statistics and the difference in the expression, the size of the difference, we were able to identify six target genes to take forward. So I'm just going to take you through the validation for our top hit, Nurexin 1. Um, so by validation, I mean how we confirm that what we we're seeing at the, in the sequencing was real and that it's really robust data and that this target really is increased in the cancer stem like cells. So first of all, we looked again at the RNA expression using RTQPCR and the this is the expression level in the primary ESL, so the original primary culture, and you can see the expression is low. Whereas in the ESCSCs, you can they see the expression is much higher and this was significant. So by a second technique, we're seeing this gene is highly expressed in the cancer stem like cells. We also looked at the protein level using immunocytochemistry. And this is an example of Nurexin 1 expression in one of our primary ES patient derived cultures. And you can see there's very little brown staining um, surrounding the cells, which is indicative of low expression. And then when you compare this to the paired Ewing sarcoma cancer stem like cells, you can see there's much more brown staining indicative of higher neurexin 1 expression in these cancer stem like cells. So these data validate what we saw in the sequencing that neurexin 1 is 
overexpressed increase in our cancer stem like cells. Well, we wanted to confirm that this was the case in tumour samples. Um, so I analysed the expression of Nurexin 1 in um, tumour samples um, from patients at diagnosis. And on the left here, you can see, using immunochemistry, I should say. And on the left here, you can see an example of a tumour with low expression where there's very little brown staining. And below, there's a, um, a tumour with very high Nurexin 1 expression, where there's very intense um, brown staining. And we were able to score these based on the number of positive cells and the intensity, so how sort of high the expression was, whether it was low expression, medium or high. And that gave us a range of scores for the tumours, um, ranging from zero, which was negative, up to 300, which was really high expression. And using statistical analysis, we were able to separate the tumours into what would be high and two groups of high and low expression. And we found when comparing this with clinical data, so outcome data, relapse status and outcome status, we were able to see that high expression of Nurexin 1 was highly predictive of a poor outcome. And this is shown in this kaplan meier figure here and, and the p-value is 0.027. But just to take you through this kaplan meier so to show you what this really means, um, in blue is the high Nurexin 1 expressing group and they actually have a score on that scale of 0 to 300 of greater than 153. And as you can see the blue line has a lot of these vertical drops and each of these vertical drops corresponds to a patient having a relapse. Whereas the red, and you can see there's a lot more in the blue line compared to the red, red line up here, which is those um, uh, patients with low expression of a Nurexin 1, so a score of less than 153, where there's hardly any of these vertical drops, so there's less relapse. And these are just reflected in, in the table down here, which is sort of a numerical version of, of the graph, where you can see patients with very high Nurexin 1 expression, so greater than 153 on our scoring system, of the 20 patients, 11 have had a relapse. And with those with low expression, th of 13 patients, only three have had a relapse. So though these are small patient numbers, it's clear to see that high expression of Nurexin 1 is, is really highly predictive of poor patient outcome. And we confirmed this in a second cohort of paraffin um, embedded tumours, looking at protein expression by immunist chemistry, um, using tumours provided to us by Kenny Rankin in, at Newcastle. And I also confirmed this in, a, in an RNA data set using an online Affymetrix array um, database. And again, predict the high expression of neurexin was highly predictive of time to first event. But perhaps the most exciting um, observation that we've made is that high Nurexin 1 actually predicts poor outcome for patients with localised disease. And just to take you back to one of the first slides where I mentioned that for currently for patients who have localised disease, 30% of those will relapse and we're currently unable to identify who those patients will be at diagnosis. So these are the kaplan meiers as I showed on the, on the previous slide, and you can see that there's a huge difference in the, the blue and the red curves. The p-value is highly significant, and there's, importantly, there's a lot more of these vertical drops indicative of more relapse in the very high Nurexin 1 expressing patients with localised disease than those um, with low NRXN1 expression. So Nurexin 1 may be useful to identify patients with localised disease that relapse and I think that's really our, our key finding. So Nurexin 1, what does it do? It's part of a pathway um, in the synapse and it involves a variety of proteins so it doesn't work on its own. Um, as a biomarker we are currently validating this um, by um, by carrying out similar studies as I've just described with these kaplan meier plots, um, analysing tumours from the Euro Ewing's 2012 study. Um, and that's going on at, um, across Europe at multiple centres. And how might we target Nurexin 1? So, as I said, Nurexin 1 is part of a pathway which involves multiple proteins. And there are some compounds out there that have been used that are part of our drug screen actually, um, that have been used to target other proteins within this pathway, although not Nurexin 1 specifically. 
Bernorexin 1 does have a role in um, cell communication and in the synapse, so in neurons, it's expressed on the cell surface where it is presented on the cell surface um, for communication with and links up with um, proteins on the postsynaptic membrane um, for neuronal cell communication. And importantly, it's also involved in um, cell communication from its own cell to other normal and different um, cells in the microenvironment. So from a cancer perspective, although very little has been investigated into the role of neurexin 1 in cancer, it's possible that neurexin 1 might have a role um, in cell communication and driving maybe the progression of the disease and development of metastasis through um, its role in communication with its surrounding cells. And importantly, neurexin 1 has been in normal cells has a role in neurodegenerative disorders and there are some compounds that have been used in this um, scenario that we might be able to then apply to um, Ewing sarcoma. So this strategy works, we are able to repurpose drugs, we can screen at both our patient derived cells, our cancer stem like cells and we're also collecting the normal cells that exist surrounding the tumour to really make some multicellular models so we can truly model the tumour microenvironment when we're um, testing these new um, therapies. We've also been able to identify novel therapeutic targets, so Neurexin 1 and others, and we've identified a new biomarker of risk. And really, this is kind of a feedback loop, really, that we're now, because we have our re drug repurposing screen, we're able to put our cancer stem like cells into this screen and really help us to validate and potentially identify some novel therapeutic agents, which may, in fact, target Neurexin 1 and that pathway. So I'd just like to acknowledge everybody involved in the Gino Ewing study um, and all our collaborators at um, all the centres, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So um, Lee Jays, Mike Parry, Dan Stark, Daniel Manson in Sheffield and Kenny Rankin in Newcastle. All members of the Children's Cancer Research Group, including our group leader, Professor Sue Birchill. And if you are interested in joining the Gino Ewing study, please contact us. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Dr. Jax Bond and Richard Foster um, from the University of Leeds for their support in setting up um, the drug screen and of course our funders because without the funding this research would just not be possible. So thank you and I'm just going to pass over to Zoe. I think. Oh yeah. <laughs> was um, like, <laughs> it wouldn't unmute for a minute. No, that's fine. Thanks very much, Liz. That was an amazing talk. Um, I'm sure everyone will, uh, will agree that it's very, very exciting work that you've been doing and the progress that's been made. Um, so following on from that, um, as you know, Bone Cancer Research Trust really do believe that collaboration and bringing researchers together is the best way to progress research. So we have a bit of an exciting announcement um, that we will be working with Professor Sue Birchall and her team to put together a specific Ewing sarcoma symposium, um, which will attract international speakers and researchers. And we are delighted to say that uh, Professor Jeff Turetsky from Georgetown um, in America has already agreed to join us and to speak and share his research updates. Um, so I'm sure many of you know Jeff. Um, he's a world leader in Ewing sarcoma research. He's both a clinician and a researcher and has dedicated much of his time to actually um, finding a molecule to target the fusion gene. Um, and now I think he's got something in, in clinical trials, a molecule in clinical trials. Um, and we also have another confirmed speaker, Dr. Didier Serdes, from the Institut Curie in France, um, whose interest is in the genetics and the epigenetics of Ewing sarcoma. Um, and the symposium will take place on the 16th of October. Um, it was going to be a face-to-face -face meeting and joined on to our patient conference. Um, we decided to go ahead with it, but to do it as a virtual meeting in light of the current situation. Um, and 
I think Sue's on the webinar. I'm not sure whether you want to add anything, Sue. Um, uh, no, Zoe, that, that's great. Um, we're um, celebrating actually 100 years um, since Ewing sarcoma was first um, described um, by Sir James Ewing. And so it's appropriate to have the research symposium this year, I think. Um, to review where we are, uh, but most importantly, I think, to see where we need to go to um, cure patients. Um, so that will be the, the main focus of the, of the meeting. Um, and everybody's welcome to, to join, um, unfortunately online. But um, as you can see, these online sessions work very well. <laughs> Absolutely. Fab. Okay, so Liz, are you alright just to stop sharing? Your... Yeah, sure. Um, just before I hand over to Vicky, who no doubt has been writing down everyone's questions. If anybody does have a question, by the way, please do type it in um, and Vicky will put it to, to Liz. Um, just from a personal perspective, um, as someone who uh, lost a loved one to Ewing sarcoma, it is, um, it, I, I personally think it's incredible the work that you've done and the fact that we could use Nurexin 1 to predict outcome I think is phenomenal you know for patients or for clinicians to know when a patient may be at risk of a tumour relapsing at, before a treatment starts to me is phenomenal and I think it's it's really incredible work that you've done so well done. Yeah we hear a lot about um, patient stratification in the common types of cancers but this really is probably the first time um, that we've heard about it in a, a bone sarcoma which is really really exciting um so i'm very proud of you yeah oh, thank you <laughs> thanks for the support <laughs> okay so uh, vicky do you want to start with the questions i will yes yes it was a brilliant talk please thank you so as usual we got uh, a few questions a couple of questions in this case that we've received in advance and i've grouped them together because they're actually related mm -hmm. so they they refer to the likelihood of recurrence so um, specifically, the question is, are they, any, so they were put by Michael Bingham and uh, Connie Nicholson. Uh, so the question is, are there any statistics which show the likelihood of urines recurring after chemotherapy, amputation, and possibly more chemo? Yeah, so I think the, the general statistics, so including all groups, whether they have metastasis at diagnosis or localised disease, is around 40 to 50 percent of patients, unfortunately, will relapse. Um, but then, as we presented in the talk, of the localised patients, it's about 30 percent. Um, but yeah, the challenge really is knowing who they are. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the questions that we've, people have been writing throughout the, uh, the, the seminar today. And I'm going to start with a question which is uh, from Dr. Daryl Green. So it's been already answered throughout the chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sue Virtual's answer, some of it's not yeah, yeah. your answer. So I'll just pass it on to you. So you, I, and people may not have seen the question, so I'm going to read it after you. So it refers about the origin of, of uh, you in South Yeah. What, where does you, you sarcoma comes from? So I'm going to read it out for everybody. So yeah, the question sure. from Daryl is, um, it's, um, <laughs> what, is uh, what do you think is the origin of the cell type cells for you in sarcoma? So what he's saying is that early work suspected leftover neural crest cell from cells from embryonic development, but a French group showed persistent neural cell crest in adults and normal uh, cells, you know. So, so he himself, Daryl, have comp he has compared gene expression between human embryonic neural crest cells and human cells, and there was a very big difference. Um, so his opinion, I mean, I don't want to... Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Is, opinion, is that urines is derived from a very early um, primitive mesenchymal cell, and which is transformed later. So, so if if it was transformed, yeah, it would have been been developed into osteosarcoma instead. Okay. Uh, so possibly Ewing's is very is a very early form and mm -hmm. early enough not to become a distinct uh, uh, to become a distinct disease. So, what is your opinion? 
I don't know if you want to answer this or yes. so yeah no I mean join in, please I would say the same as Sue so there is evidence that Ewing sarcoma arises from mesenchymal stem cells and that as Sue mentioned as well osteosarcomas don't contain the fusion and that's really the initiating event for Ewing's mm -hmm. within a permissive environment so yeah I think from what we know at the moment and evidence in our lab where we've added the fusion to stem cells I think most likely Ewing sarcoma arises in mesenchymal stem cells um, and I think that's widely accepted generally is it Sue would you say current opinion <laughs> Are you okay if I say so? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it, it is. The, the evidence is that these are tumours in mesenchymal stem cells. And I think some of the confusion comes when we think about Ewing's as a tumour of bone. Yeah. Um, because the tumours actually arise in the periosteum, which is the cells on the outside of the bone. And um, these periosteum is actually a mesenchymal derived tissue and is a source of mesenchymal stem cells. So what we believe, and there's lots of evidence in the literature to support this, is that the fusion is in one of these cells when we see Ewing's in a bone. And, and then the tumour grows into the bone. So of course you see the tumour when, often when it's diagnosed, the tumour's already invaded into the bone. But actually it's not initiated in the bone cell, it's in the periosteum the out, out, outside the bone. I hope that's clear. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah, would you be able to comment briefly on what do you mean by a mesenchymal? Because not everyone might realise what you mean. So that's quite difficult to do. <laughs> I'll try, I shall try. Um, so of course during development um, we start with, you know, very simple cells that are not differentiated and these cells differentiate into multiple cells to produce um, an embryo and then and then a human being which to me I, th I think is an incredible process but a mesenchymal stem cell arises from an early primitive neural cell so when Daryl talks about these early primitive cells they are neural cells um, and so actually the mesenchymal cell, cell of, of which we think the Ewing's arise in is, is more likely from the neural tube during development whereas um, later on we'd get the development of the neural crest and, and you know other tumours may arise in neural crest cells during development are predisposed to those tumours. But mesenchymal cells, we know they're mesenchymal because they have a particular expression profile. So we can look for genes and proteins that are expressed on these cells that reflect where which tissue they, they are from, the origin of that tissue. Does, does that help? Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there is a follow-on comment from Daryl. In theory, <laughs> sorry, I'm reading. Uh, so in theory, would you expect you in, uh, to contain far more stem-like properties than osteosarcoma cells? I mean, that's something we have seen. So in our RNA sequencing data, we see that the Ewing sarcomas, the patient-derived cells, express really high levels of a lot of stem cell. Marker. So that's actually a technique that some people use to isolate cancer stem-like cells by isolating cells that have really high expression of these cells, but actually uh, of these markers. But actually, the Ewing cells express really high levels of these markers, and they are primitive cells. So, and they're poorly differentiated. So, yes, I think there would be more stem-like properties certainly in osteosarcoma. I would expect with them being less. Can, just, can I just add as well that it's important to distinguish between expression of mesenchymal markers oh. and be a cell of mesenchymal origin yeah. versus being a cancer stem-like cell, a Ewing's stem-like cell, because mm -hmm. not all mesenchymal cells have the ability to self-renew and are drug resistant. Most of them yeah. are actually capable of, well, they respond to chemotherapy um, so this this is where it, in the literature some people have tried to use the mesenchymal markers to define the, the stem cell like population in the cancer but but 
that's not necessarily the case. When you sequence Ewing sarcomas, the, the tumor cells are mesenchymal, yeah, all of yeah. them. And it's a subpopulation that the stem cell-like cells that are drug resistant and able to self-populate in the nice presentation that Liz has just explained. Thanks. I'm going to move on. I'm going to do the sort of in the order you presented. So I'm going to try to do it in this <laughs> order of your presentation. So uh, I have a question about the, um, the high throughput screen, the, the repair. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's about uh, the collection of compounds, the library of compounds that you are testing. Uh, where do they come from? Are they, do they contain anything and everything or are they particularly biased to uh, say and kinases, GPCRs, anything? Yeah. So it's a Tokris screen, which is a, okay. a company, so it's commercially available. You can buy it, basically. Um, and it consists of, I think it's 1,200 compounds in the screen. So this is our initial screen. Um, and the compounds that are in the screen are not focused at all. It's not a TKI screen. It's a really wide, broad, wide ranging screen and importantly actually contains a lot of compounds that um, will target a lot of sort of the new promising targets that have been reported in the literature by ourselves and others. So we are covering a, it's covering a wide range of potential therapeutic targets. So we should, it, it's a really good, it's not too focused, I don't think it's not focused on one type of inhibitor or compound. Thank you. So I'm going to move on now towards this sort of, what, once you've identified the different genes, so you did a, 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 a gene profiling. And yeah. So of course you isolate the neurexin as an area of interest, but there's another question uh, from Ramona Niegu, and she says, what about other upregulated genes okay. uh, from the DE hits? Uh, were there any of them correlated to with poor prognosis? Yeah, so some of them were, um, some of them weren't. Um, so they all validated in the sense that they went through the initial PCR experiments and protein experiments to show that the data we got from the sequencing was sound. So what the sequencing generates is robust data. Um, and then when we went to look up at them predicting prognosis, I think two of the six have predict outcome um, for patients. But interestingly, we actually expanded our field because NRXM1 was so highly predictive and particularly for the localized patients. We actually looked at the expression and prognostic significance of other proteins within that Nurexin 1 pathway. So that affect the behavior of Nurexin 1 and also interact with Nurexin 1 for its function. And there's two of those target proteins are also predicting outcomes. So it's not that sort of gives us further evidence of the importance of NRX in one and that whole pathway because there's multiple proteins involved in the pathway that are predicting outcome for patients. And these proteins are also members of a, an even bigger group um, that we're hoping to investigate further. So they're from a family of proteins in the in the neuron. So we're hoping to look at those um, in future studies. But so lots of work. <laughs> So before I move on to the focus a little bit more on the neurexin area, uh, there's just a question that just come up from Piros Pada, which is um, it's sort of taking your research to the next level. Uh, mm -hmm. Any of these potential inhibitors that you might identify from the HDS or in general, um, um, could they, would they, any of this would be able to differentiate between a um, cancer stem cell like versus healthy normal cells? Yeah. Sure. So this is obviously really important and the key to when we're, you're doing any drug finding, drug discovery yeah. um, strategy. And Nurexin 1 importantly has very low expression in most normal tissues. And that's also the case for some of the um, other proteins that I mentioned that were part of that pathway. So there's very low expression in normal cells in any way. Um, mm -hmm. But also the CSCs have such high expression of this target, perhaps you don't need to treat with very much of the drug to have an effect on those CSCs if you were to find this the magic <laughs> um, drug that would hit the target. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you a few questions which are also about new vaccines. So 
Uh, and you probably answered them already throughout the talk, but I uh, just want to focus on a few things. So one is, so Nurexin, um, are you sure, is, is, is it like it's a market? Does it, is it behaving like a market of stemness or resistance or, or is it functionally involved in the yeah. behavior of those cells? Sure, yeah, so that's a really good question because obviously you might have a marker, but it's not actually doing anything. So we've done some studies in the lab using our patient-derived cells where we've been able to knock down, so get rid of the expression of Nurexin 1. And we've actually shown that this can decrease the growth of the cells. So it does have functional activity, is doing something in, in the cells. It does have a functional role. So that's why targeting it as well would be important. So when you it. knock it down, this, do you then have a better response to, for example, the... Do you see a change in the response to... Do, do you see therapy? a change and they yeah. respond better? So the, there is a role for an Rx in one in drug response and, and growth of cells. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I, have a, I have a particular interest in sort of CNS diseases and this is why yeah. like me wonder about this. You mentioned that uh, Nurexin is associated with, um, uh, you know, neuronal communication, presynaptic, and, and like, it's actually known to have a role in autism and some schizophrenia and things like that. And I know this is probably a little bit off the wall, but I was thinking if there is any evidence anywhere that patients with autism or in the, in the autistic spectrum do better or worse in terms of um, you sarcoma. I know I'm asking you a small yeah. population within yeah. a small population, but yeah. have you seen any evidence anywhere that... No, I don't, I haven't is. seen any evidence. I think, again, it's the caveat of having a relatively small patient group that I just think that work hasn't been yeah. done. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting concept because if neurexin 1 is involved in these diseases. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also it relates to this one also. So uh, because they're involved in, you know, um, like neurexin is involved in um, communication. So mm -hmm. in your set of inhibitors or in, in your HDS cells, do you have um, um, like calcium uh, blockers or, or GABA yes. inhibitors, anything, anything to do with ion channels? Yes, I think there's a whole there's a whole section on on ion channels. So there's a whole sort of twenty thirty compounds of various ion channels. So that that's really good. So we'll be covering that. You'll be covering those. Area. So no, that's great. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fingers crossed, we get some good hits. Yeah, that would be really exciting. Yeah. So it's a bit of a um, a kind of like. A, a, a sort of a debate question. I think it's about stem cells, you know. So mm -hmm. the question from Armin that it's it really relates to how difficult or or how can the effects that we eventually would result from in interacting with stem cells. So he's saying mm -hmm. targeting stem cells make them more resistant to further cytotoxic agents, causing mm -hmm. further malignancy in the long run. I mean, that's a good question, but th what we are aiming to do is to actually target that the drug resistance that those cells have. So they have drug resistance. So we will be coming at those drugs with a specific um, inhibitor strategy of some kind that would get rid of those CSP. So hopefully you'll kill them all. So yeah, you have any left to before you get to there's none left. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. it. But it's a good question because it's a good consideration with any new drug that is there going to be a resistance, any resistance induced, um, and then you really, really can't get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I just add because um, th these cells that Liz is working with that she's targeting are resistant to current chemotherapy. Yeah. So that that's that's the I think the question was about whether you would make them more resistant to chemotherapy. Um, but these cells are resistant to chemotherapy. If we could kill them with chemotherapy, we'd have cured Ewing's patients yeah. years ago. Yeah. So um, these cells we still need chemotherapy in my opinion to treat patients because that eradicates a lot of tumor cells but it's this driver population that we're not currently hitting with the chemotherapy that, that's causing the progression and the relapse. And so that's why this dual approach, I think, is so promising. 
Yeah, I agree that yeah, they're not going to make them more resistant because they were resistant already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there is also, there is a question uh, from Phil K. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, is there a predictive stage uh, uh, from the markers at the early enough? Sorry, let me read it. So is there a predictive stage from the markers early enough stage to prevent metastasis? So the work that I presented is actually analysing diagnosis tumours. So that's patients at diagnosis when they've had their sample initially taken. So in theory, yes, we will be able to know initially, if validated, of course, that which patients may, may go on to relapse. So yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a final comment from Phil Kay as well. So I appreciate this mm -hmm. difficult question, but in <laughs> what progress is being made towards positive outcomes? I think, well, I think our drug repurposing screen is really promising because they are clinically approved compounds. They are compounds that have passed safety testing and would be rapidly fast tracked into the clinic if we found something that was, you know, relevant. And of course, there's trials out there like Recur that are open for newer new agents to be adopted so there are pathways for new agents um, and thinking about the if it's positive outcomes thinking about the the biomarker aspect and predicting relapse then we're on with that we are validating this biomarker in the euro ewing's cohort of tumors um, so we're on our way <laughs> um, i don't know if sue if you have a comment on so it was really as you mentioned it already i just wanted to make people aware that we are actually collaborating with um, our colleagues in Europe to try and compare this biomarker with any other potential biomarkers of high risk for localised patients. Um, this is work that's ongoing at the moment. Um, yeah. And what we're hoping, we're trying to fast track this through in the next um, two months, which is quite challenging in the current environment, um, but that's what we're, we're hoping to do because if we can find a, a biomarker combination mm -hmm. that does identify reliably at diagnosis these patients with localised disease, then that might be used in the next clinical trial um, to randomise patients with localised disease that are predicted to relapse into the metastatic treatment arm. So that has got big implications for the treatment of 30% of patients with localised disease, as Liz says, um, depending on the outcome of the current studies. Um, and we also have a collaboration with a drug company who are making um, antibodies to these kind of cell surface molecules. So that's, um, that's also some interesting work that we're trying to take forward. <laughs> There's, there's, one, there's a couple more questions. So um, one is, the, is from Victoria Tippett and she's asking, with Nurexin 1 involved in cell, cell communication, uh, would you know or expect mm -hmm. this to occur between CSCs and CSCs, CSCs to <laughs> or CSCs to the microenvironment? I think that's something we're wanting to investigate and get a handle on, but I think all of those are possible whether it because we know that the CSC you know we think the CSC these driver cells can they affect the bulk cancer cells can they induce resistance in the surrounding cells do the CSC interact with the microenvironment yes um so I think all of yeah all of the above <laughs> but that's something we're working on and hoping to you know understand as we learn more about the mechanism of neurexin winning cancer because very little is known about neurexin winning cancer it's mainly been you know, work in neurodegenerative diseases and neurodevelopment. There is a question last comment, so I want you to actually clarify that. It's from Diana. Diana. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and she's wondering that you are talking about resistance cells, but some human cells do respond to chemotherapy. Yes. Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, so certainly. So, you, yeah, tumor cells do respond to chemotherapy. They chemotherapies do induce cell deaths in, in tumor cells. So yeah, that's it. But in our studies, we've seen in vitro in the lab that when you treat with 
some of the cells with chemotherapy and not killing every single cell. Um, but chemotherapy does work and it does kill the bulk cancer cells. Um, yeah, there is a question which it's, I, I haven't actually um, asked the question because I think you've already answered it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it refers to the hits from your yeah. Uh, yeah. In screen. So the, it was, it's from Angela's Street, but you've already answered the question when um, sure. Ramon and Nico asked about the other hits from the gene screen, I think. Um, okay. I think, let me just check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have any more questions. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you both. And thank you, Sue, as well, for um, also shipping in. That was great. Really good. Um, so thank you, everyone. We hope you found that really um, insightful and inspiring. Um, Liz, let's just hope there's a compound out there that will hit Nurex in one. And yeah. it is a, a game-changing leap forward, potentially, for human sarcoma patients. So really excellent work. Um, so this is our last bite-sized research webinar of this series. Um, so we'd just like to thank everyone um, for those of you that have joined us on the previous ones um, and obviously for those that have joined us today. Um, just to say you will get an automated email in about half an hour's time or 27 minutes to be precise, which is just going to ask you for your feedback um, on the series. So even if you've only attended one, please do give us your feedback. It's a very short survey, only eight questions. Um, just to get a feel as to whether you've enjoyed it, whether it's been pitched right, you know, if you found it um, excuse me, insightful, and also to find out if, there are, if we were to do another one, what kind of things would you like us to cover? So please do fill that out and, uh, and uh, send back your feedback. Um, the video from today's webinar will be made available early next week, as with all the previous uh, webinars, we'll send out an email with a link to that. Um, but finally, I just want to say thank you ever so much for joining us and thank you very much to Liz for giving up your time and joining us, putting together the presentation and again to Professor Sue Birchall. Zoe, do you want to add anything? Uh, it's, um, we've, we've really, really enjoyed putting these webinars on and we, we really hope you've enjoyed them. So please do let us know your thoughts and if we can hold any more for you that you might find interesting. We're very, very happy to do so. Brilliant. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you ever so much. Have a lovely weekend, wherever you are, and uh, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.